Morning folks, welcome back. Um, we are, first of all, do not watch this video if it's gonna cause you any stress or anxiety because there's nothing you can do about your exam, you've already done it. Um, so any stress or anxiety, do not watch this video instead. Go and study for your next exam or go out and enjoy yourself and study leave if you've got any time left, I hope you have. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rip through the answers to part two, 2023 chemistry. Higher chemistry that is. Some easy, obvious ones I'm probably just going to gloss over and I might spend some time on the problem-solving ones. Okay, what we got? Ionisation energy. We're opening up with this. A graph of ionisation energy. Explain why there's an increase in the first ionisation energy from elements with D to K. Um, only worth one mark, so I'm going to guess, simply saying, more protons uh, are in the atoms holding the electrons tighter. Um, would they accept slight decrease in atomic radius? Because that's true as well. I don't know. That's another, uh, some of our get out. I'm not the SQ, of course, and these are my guest solutions. So you can't take them as gospel and use them to judge a mark. And I probably made mistakes. Happens a lot. Select an element from A to M that represents group seven. Well, the highest point here is always going to be group eight. So the one down from it. So J or B um, for these ones. What we got here? Explain fully, fully for two marks, the large increase between the first and second ionization energies. Okay, uh, when you strip off for sodium, you're going from 281 to 28. Uh, and you're removing this electron, then you're wanting to remove one of these. So there's an entire layer of shielding missing. Also, it's just simply closer to the nucleus. I think that's the two marks. Use information to determine that. And, all right, so we're going from 1 plus to 3 plus. So we need the second and the third ionization energies. Add them together, you get that. Don't put the units, of course, because they're in the question. Sorry about all the foldy paper noises. Definitions time. Uh, electronegativity is the attraction that an atom has for a shared pair of electrons. I'm going to guess that you probably need the shared and the pair because uh, they're getting sticky on definitions these days, the SQA been taking lessons off biology. Uh, explain fully why electronegativity goes down a group. Again, two marks. Decreases going down a group. The, uh, the nucleus is further from the shared pair, and also there's more shielding between the nucleus and the shared pair, which seems to be just the opposite of the previous question. Fine if you know your stuff, I suppose. A relatively easy two marks. Uh, the best reducing agent, you're looking for the top right the bra, the best reducing agent is in the top right, and we're hunting for group two on strontium is the top one you find in your ECS. Um, Bottom point, different hydrides here. Okay, explain fully why the boiling points of the group four hydrides increase. So group four hydrides, this line here, why is the boiling point increasing as you go down the group? Three marks. I'm not sure how they're going to assign these. And then your answer, you should refer to the intermolecular forces involved. Yeah, but still, I'm puzzled. Um, there are more electrons per molecule as you go down the group. Therefore, there are stronger LDFs, and the stronger LDFs cause higher boiling points. But I don't know how to get three marks out of that. Sorry, I'm being thick. Uh, the type of bonding that is responsible. Ammonia is a hydrogen bonding. That's why ammonia pops up at the end here. For it should be down here, but it isn't. Of course, the same thing applies to water. Uh, this is a Hess's Law question. It's quite a gift, actually, for two marks, because it's super simple. Um, according to me, if I keep my target on screen, there we go. There's your target equation there. We need a silicon, two hydrogens, and a silicon uh, silane, sorry, uh, as they're, they're not calling it that. They're calling it silicon hydride. So we need uh, equation B times one. That gives you your silicon. Equation C times two. That gives you your two hydrogens. And then we need to flip equation A, so that's times negative one. That is my sum. Um, percentage yield. Actual over theoretical. Actual is easy. Tells you that. 2.56 grams. Theoretical is a wee bit trickier. You've got to get it from the, the, the balanced equation. We're interested. Nice of them to highlight it. We're interested in these two chemicals here. And if you had 76 grams, you would have made 32 grams. If you do a proportion, we actually had 15.32, which seems an oddly specific number. Why have they gone four significant figures there? and not anywhere else. Don't know. 15.32 grams will give you that mass there. So pop uh, 2.56, I've forgotten to write it in, over that. Times 100, you get 39.9%. Table shows the boiling points. Explain fully. Is this the third explain fully, or am I just having deja vu? 
Or am I just having deja vu? Or am I just having deja vu? <laughs> Sorry, I have to amuse myself or get bored through these. Uh, why silicon oxide? Oh, this is an intro. Yeah, I might pause the video and just go and check. Yeah, I did, okay. Um, it's an interesting question. It's, I think it's an old, old one, if I remember correctly, or a modification of an old one. Basically, another three marks, I don't know how they're going to be allocated. Um, silicon hydride is molecular covalent. You can tell that from its boiling point. Uh, therefore, it will be held together, to, not together, as in in there, but another one of these to its neighbouring SiH4 by London dispersion forces. Silicon dioxide is the bit that had me saying this is interesting because this is actually N5 content as far as I'm aware, and I didn't think they were in the habit of doing an overlap between N5 and higher, but whatever. I'm hoping you remember from last year that silicon dioxide is a giant covalent network. The clue is there, of course, even if you didn't remember it, the clue's in the melting point. Therefore, it's held together by covalent bonds, and covalent bonds are str much stronger than LDFs. I think that's how you get your three marks. Uh, Propane 123 trial, glycerol. Um, condensation reactions. These are too easy, I'm not spending any time on these. This one here, what's going on here? Uh, functional group, just name it, it's a carbonyl group. Or if you're now red, carbonyl, for some reason. Must be a Canadian thing. If you haven't watched now red, go and have a look at his stuff. It's good stuff on YouTube. Name molecule Y, it's heptan 2 on. Uh, yep. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yep, heptan 2 on. The converting Y into Z, well, that's going from a ketone into an alcohol. Unusually, they asked that, but totally fine. It's reduction. Um, totally fine, it's reduction. State which of the reactions results in an increase in the oxygen to hydrogen ratio, i.e. which one is oxidation. Now, normally, if it was me, I'd be looking for an alcohol into a carboxylic acid or an alcohol into an aldehyde or whatever. This is sneaky because I actually had to go back and check it. None of them seem to be. But this one here has added an extra oxygen in and removed two hydrogens. So the answer to that is reaction one. Good, I like that. It's an unusual application of the oxygen to hydrogen ratio. Fatty acids, uh, an example of a carboxylic, uh, hydroxy carboxylic acid is shown below. So it's got the hydroxyl and the carboxylic acid. And these form a cyclic ester. Now the clue here is in cyclic, which is why I've done this nice big purple. It's going to loop around and join to itself. Here's an example of a cyclic ester. Draw a structural formula for the hydroxy carboxylic acid that I actually used to make this. Well, as you can see, I've chopped it there and I've counted out my carbons and sort of like unraveled this circle here and you get this structure here. You need to add the hydrogens, of course, to it. No naming involved or anything like that. So nice and straightforward so far. Poppy, I hope you watched my video. I did warn you, there's always a chromatography question in here. Uh, chromatography of cheese, yummy. Uh, determine the retention time in minutes of the peak in X that's missing from Y. Oh yeah, uh, just this peak here. Uh, my only question is the accuracy of the scale. It looks to be about 12 and a half. I don't know what the plus and minus will accept here because this is not a terribly accurate scale to read. I completely agree. So there's probably a decent amount of leeway here. Uh, this one here, yeah, I've seen this before in the past. The problem with doing this for 30 years is you've seen most things. And I've seen this where the, it was cut off at the top there. And they asked you how to fix that particular problem. So the, it's gone off the scale here. And the answer to that is a couple of ways, I suppose. You can dilute your sample before you put it in, or you can use a smaller volume or smaller massive sample. I'm not sure what they'll accept there. This one here had me a bit puzzled. And in fact, I wasn't just puzzled, I was sort of stuck at it. That's an essential amino acid, so we won't talk about that anymore. You can, you must get them through your diet. Uh, big shout out to all the veggies out there, because you're getting your essential amino acids. Uh, carnivores aren't. Use the information from the diagram on the table. Draw structure for glutamic acid. Now, glutamic acid, relative proportion, I'm assuming it means there's two of glutamic acids in this chain here. But as you can see, there's also two leucines. So I've numbered, there's one, two, there's one, two. I don't quite, so and I've, done, I've done both of them, I don't quite know which, how you're supposed to tell which one's glutamic acid. Maybe they'll accept either. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just being thick. That's entirely possible. Happens a lot. Denaturing is changing shape. Uh, the function of an emulsifier is to mix a polar and a non-polar substance together or equivalent of that, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, you know, whatever, something along these lines. This is calcium propanoate, that salt there. Uh, practical open-ended question. I might be coming back to that at the end. I'm not fond of practical open-ended questions because it, there, there is an answer to them. 
you know, there's a very specific answer, and maybe that's what they're looking for in this particular case, but I prefer the ones where you just get to talk about an area of the course. Then again, you could argue. It's the same thing. Uh, what would I talk about that? Yeah, hold on two seconds. Let's not skip it. What would I talk about on that? Accurately. So, I talk about selection of glassware, perhaps. You can talk about the fact that beakers uh, are pretty sucky, and... Um, and pipettes and burettes. Pipettes are the best, closely followed by burettes. I would talk perhaps about how to read a burette. You could talk about the curve of the meniscus, put a piece of white paper behind it to see it clearer, put a, a bit of white paper uh, above your conical flask, he says, showing off his epic drawing skills. Um, something like that. Make sure you're always on the horizontal with this. Do multiple readings, look for concordancy. There's all sorts of stuff you can talk about. Maybe I was just being pessimistic. Gin is made by flavouring a uh, mixture of ethanol with plant extracts. What is this going on here? It's a... It's a three marker. Calculation, yeah. This took me longer than I would have thought, and the numbers are quite big. Calculate the volume in litres of carbon dioxide gas that we produced if 16 litres of glucose was fermented. A 50 ml sample of the glucose solution contained 5.79 grams of glucose. So what I've done here, oh 16, I, okay. I started off with, if you had 50 mils of the sample, it would have 5.79 grams of glucose. 16 litres of the sample, please don't forget that's sneaky. 16,000 centimetres cubed will contain a bucket load of glucose. Um, and then what I did here was, I then linked from the equation, so it's a one to two equation here, so 180, that was kindly giving you the GFM, 180 grams, will produce two moles of gas, uh, which is two lots of t 24. Um, slightly disingenuously, they're giving you the mass of that. Don't really need the mass of that, um, because they're not asking for a mass, they're asking for a volume. So back to this, we figured out that you had this number of grams of glucose, so pop that in your glucose column, and then you will come out to 494 litres of gas. Or you can do a Charlie and you can do it by moles, there's nothing to stop you. And you can turn that into moles by dividing by the GFM. Multiply your answer by two, and that'll be the number of moles of carbon dioxide, and then multiply that by 24. But yeah, the 44 is not needed. That's a destructor there. Atom economy, uh, it's two production of ethanol. Why did I multiply that by two? Oh yeah, because there's two of them, that's why. Um, so it's the total mass of the desired product over the mass of um, your reactant, so 51%. Uh, problem solving, a uh, question on using a piece of equipment that you've probably never heard of, a hydrometer. Um, it's basically just read the difference here. I calculated, I read that as 1.075.985, work out the difference between these two. Um, and then, where, oh, that, that number there comes from. I was going to say, where did this magical number pop from? There, that's where it comes from. It's just a number they tell you to use. 12.2%. Chemical test between an alcohol and a ketone. Alcohols can be oxidised, ketones cannot. So one of your classic oxidising agents, uh, do you have to give the results? Yes. So make sure you include the correct colour change, where it starts and where it ends for any one of these guys here. They should accept any of them. Um, these are terpenes. Um, what's this alternating double and single bond things? These are terpenes, they're um, units of isoprene, and you're looking for C5H8-ish uh, here, and that corresponds to that. There may be another one, but it was too late at night, and I thought I'll just stop there. Duranol acetate is an ester, and it can be hydrolyzed. It will produce an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. Look back at the structure here. You can see where I've snapped the ester, and that is going to be your carboxylic acid, two carbons, ethanoic acid. Back of a beer mat calculation here, um, our proportion ones, 70 kilograms uh, will require 700 milligrams. Where did I get that from? Because 10 milligrams are required for one kilogram. So 70 kilograms will require 700 milligrams. Um, they want one day, and that's in every eight hours. So therefore, multiply it by three, you'll need 2,100 milligrams of quinine um, in a day. Yeah, don't try that at home. Um, my grandfather apparently used to drink quinine. He got malaria during his service in World War I, apparently. There are much better alternatives nowadays than quinine. Um, this is a negative. 
It's therefore it's an exothermic reaction, so basically finish the reaction anywhere below this line here. Activity complex is the name for that. Not going to talk any more about that. Um, calculations. Which reactant was excess? This is sort of a worst case uh, excess situation for us because it's a solid and a solution. So we do indeed have to um, use Charlie's method here and turn everything into moles. So the solution, if you turn it into moles, oh yeah, this this was quite a s sneaky question. I like it, I do like it, but I hope it doesn't put a lot of people off because look at the number of moles involved. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, but, but because you've got... A, um, 1,000 litres and it's 9.5 moles per litre away, I don't dip your fingers in that, then you end up with 12,500 moles of acid. And if you do the same for 220 kilograms of ammonia, that's 220,000 grams, then you end up with a similar number of moles. Do the comp You can actually just do a straight comparison here, though. It's a one-to-one -one comparison and you can see that there's excess ammonia. Um, Suggest why the method's shown... Now, oh, this method here, so direct reaction, is preferred over this to make ammonium nitrate. Th there'll be a bucket load of acceptable answers here, um, including less byproducts, um, cheaper reactants maybe, um, a better atom economy, something along these lines. Um, any one of these uh, would be acceptable, I would imagine, and probably some that I haven't thought of. Um, suggest what is represented by the area under the... Yeah. I'm not sure about this one. I might come back to this one at the end if I remember. Because uh, I know what the answer is, but I don't know if you know what the answer is. Uh, add a second curve to show the distribution. Yeah, you've got to add a second uh, curve with the apex to the right of the uh, when we started here. Graph Z, uh, this is a kinetic energy distribution graph. And there's the activation energy on there. Your second line is anywhere to the left. Your activation energy with a catalyst. Um, Dynamic equilibrium. Uh, quite a few states. They just want definitions. Fair enough. It's only worth one mark. That's when the forward and backward reaction rates, excuse me, are equal to each other. Or they might accept when the concentrations no longer change. Uh, I'm not sure what they're looking for uh, on that one. Um, the ammonia production is continuously removed. Explain how this affects the production of ammonia for two marks. It will slow down the reverse reaction. It will move the balance to the right-hand side. So in other words, you may end up making more ammonia, but I don't know how they're going to distribute these marks there. I'm afraid that's why I'm not one of the markers, or one of the setters, actually. A flow chart time. Um, from the flow chart, which I think is completely... From the flow diagram, state another way that the manufacturing process involves maximizes profit. So they have recycled... Sorry. Read the question, hey. Oh, okay, so one way they're telling you they're using a heat exchanger. So you've got to find the other way. That's why it's recycling gases. Okay. I suppose, could you put selling waste products? No, because there are no waste products in this one. So I don't think they'd accept that. Um, right, it's combining uh, the reduction and the oxidation together. There's two ways to do it. You can multiply, if you're lazy like me, you can multiply the top one by 1.5. Or if you're enthusiastic, you can do times three and times two. I'm not going to do that. You know how to do this. It's just donkey work. It's National 5 stuff there, actually. I just don't forget to not include the electrons in the overall equation. I identify the reducing agent. The reducing agent gets oxidized. Therefore, it is ammonia. Tap water. Uh, that's hard water. I'm always looking for a fight. Um, circled region, that's the hydrophilic part. Would they accept polar, perhaps, or ionic? I'm not sure. Uh, that makes it sound terrible, by the way, dissolved metal ions. It's calcium magnesium from the rocks, and as far as I know, no areas of Scotland apply that. I don't know why it's come back into the Scottish curriculum. It's quite funny. It certainly applies down the south of England, though. Um, what's going on here? It's a straightforward titration, isn't it? It's a nice, easy gift of a titration. Thank you, SQA. Three marks, nothing nasty. There's the setup there. There's the moles of EDTA that dripped out. It's a one-to-one -one reaction. There is absolutely nothing sneaky going on. So that's the same number of moles in the bottom beaker. And that, I think, is my concentration. Don't put the units in. It's already in the question. Did I get the on screen? Didn't get the answer on screen, hey? Helps when you show them the answer, man. Pretend to be professional. 
Oh, this is nice. Yes, thank you, SQA. And if you watch my video on researching chemistry, you'll find me whinging about the fact that in the past, it hasn't been obvious where the rogue point is. This is obviously a rogue point, and I have completely ignored it. Try and do a best fit line, and I think I come up with about 5 at 0 0.08. I don't know what the acceptance of error will be on that. Um, probably not very much. Maybe a single box either way. I don't know. What's going on here, folks? Explain the difference in polarities of trichloromethane and tetrachloromethane. Are we on screen? Yes, we are. Well, yeah, this one is totally symmetrical. So although there is, you could probably do this diagrammatically as well. You could show that it's delta minus. These are all delta minus, but they're all pulling in exactly balanced configurations. So overall, this molecule is nonpolar. Or you could say it's totally symmetrical. So therefore, it's nonpolar. And uh, that means the overall polarity is, is nothing. Um, and this one here, this you can see, these two are still pulling. This does not have a high enough EN difference to be regarded as a polarized bond. So this is not totally symmetrical or it's uneven balance, unbalanced pulling. Therefore, the overall charge is on the molecule. Not sure how they're going to allocate these two marks. Bonds broken and bonds made. Uh, nice and easy. They've even given you the diagrams here so you could literally just chop these bonds up and stack them up here down below as you're doing it, which is what I've done. Uh, a couple of the brighter people in the audience are probably shouting at me and saying, yeah, you don't need that. That's going to cancel out with one of these, and that is going to cancel out. I know, I know. I made a mistake teaching this a long time ago, and I always feel terrible when making mistakes, so I just dismantle everything and then rebuild everything. These are all positive. These are all negative. Put them together. You get that answer there. Don't put the units in because it's in the question. This is a nice open-ended question. Um, it's super wide open talking about um, any of these flavors aromas. It's, it's like half the organic course. It's wonderful. Um, just don't be tempted to write too much. You can do it diagrammatically in chemistry. Remember, they're always looking for examples of diagrams and equations. Try and always put an equation in. Uh, Miss Davison quotes me on, or doesn't quote me, Miss Davison, I'll quote her actually, says, give an example, then give a reaction. There goes with it. Halo alkanes. Never heard of them. That's okay. It's advanced higher content, but this is problem solving, so everything's fine. This is nice. I like the problem solving in this paper, actually. It's pretty good. Apart from that amino acid one. Still got me a bit stumped. Um, larger molecules of a higher boiling point. So as you go down this way here, and also as you go down group seven, um, you end up with a higher boiling point. Um, that's the two conclusions I would put for that one here. Name the strongest type of intermolecular forces broken when bromoethane boils. These are the electronegativities of carbon and bromine. That is a pretty small difference. So uh, initially, it's definitely not hydrogen bonding. I don't think they're looking for dipole-dipole uh, or permanent dipole. It's just, just to infuse anybody with a tendency of dyslexia there, eh? I feel sorry for you. I'm pretty sure it's LDFs. Um, London dispersion forces. Halo alkanes. Um, why is it a secondary? Because uh, the bromine is attached to a carbon, which is attached to two other carbons. I think that's what they're looking for there. An isomer that's a tertiary. Well, you could have four carbons here, and it would have to be the, that. There's no other option, really. It's that. Put the edges on. You don't have a degree in chemistry yet. Um, termination steps. I think you have a choice. You can put two methyl radicals together to form C2H6, or you could put a methyl and bromine radical to make that. You've got to have two radicals, though, and no radicals on that side. That's the definition of termination steps, really. Ultraviolet will set this off. Um, this was a lot of work for one mark. Uh, compound R does not react with tollens, therefore R is a ketone. Um, draw a structural formula for P. So if R is a ketone, you're working backwards to that. That must have been a secondary alcohol. And I've answered this. Oh, this is why you check your answers over, guys. I actually left it with the secondary alcohol. That's not what they're asking. RTFQ, hey, they're asking for P. So that is replaced with a bromine because it gets knocked off, replaced with an OH to form the secondary alcohol, which is then oxidized to make the ketone. Uh, this is a Kieran question. Kieran Salisbury, yes, this is definitely your question right here. I would have left this to the end because this is all new to us, but it's all completely doable if you can read and follow the instructions. And the answer that I came up with was 2-bromo-111-trifluoropentane. Number 10. Um, I'm not sure how to allocate the marks here. 
uh, you weigh the crucible on the, as in zero the balance, weigh the crucible, measure the weight, so say 42.01, say, grams, and then that's the weight of the crucible. Uh, then you'd add your stuff until you're one and a half grams heavier than that, so 43.51, and then you're done. But I'm not sure how that's going to be split up for this. Let me just fit this one on the screen here. Gas tight crucible. SQA equipment must be better than ours. Let me go and get one, just for demonstrate. And now, do you know what? Do you know what? Let's. The last time. I criticised, I got in trouble. So let's just go with my answer in inverted commas here. This is what the SQA are asking for, to let the carbon dioxide escape. You go ask your chemistry teacher whether they think, in the real world, taking the lid off would be a good idea or not. Even just from time to time. But I'm not going to say any more there. High temperature. Uh, oh, sorry, explain about Bunsen burner. Yeah, it gets a nice high temperature, or there's nothing flammable, I would imagine. Um... It's nice and quick, even. That would be... I'd accept that's a valid answer. Super fast. Uh, once crucible had cooled, uh, this is a nice use of advanced higher techniques. I like this, because it's a calculation based on this. Um, I got 0 0.5. So magnesium uh, carbonate and carbon dioxide are the two chemicals we're interested in. It's a one-to-one -one reaction. Substitute the masses in, or go with moles if you like. Um, whatever keeps you happy. And I got that. Uh, here we go. Another experiment to determine the mass of magnesium carbonate involves... It's its a drawing equipment one. It's unusual in that they've given you the end and you have to draw the star, but that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I would have had a conical flask. You can have a beaker. Any sort of sealed up container. You can't have the seal going through the tube here, though. The delivery tube has got to be accessible into inside here. And uh, you, you're supposed to label it. So here's the mixture. It just says excess acid. I couldn't see which acid they wanted to use. Maybe I missed it. Maybe it was earlier on. I did this late at night. I'm sorry. Um, suggest why carbon dioxide can be collected over water. Yeah. Again, in inverted commas, it's insoluble in water. Go and ask your chemistry teacher again, see what they say. This is not the way I'd do it. For analytical purposes, certainly. It's fine for, like, third year level, but if I wanted a volume to actually use in a calculation, which is what they've done here, I know they've used a mass. Um, oh, no, they've used a mass. Oh, maybe it's not for analytical. Oh, okay, I'll take it back. Maybe my criticism is unfounded. But insoluble in water, I think, is the SQA's answer. That's what they're looking for. But go and ask your teacher that, just out of curiosity. I went and looked it up. This happens to be the actual solubility data of carbon dioxide at 25 degrees. That's quite a lot. Let's move on. Oh, we're done. End of question paper. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.